Welcome to the guest lecture on international lawmaking, which is delivered in the context of the CILE Academy 2021. We are delighted to welcome to the Academy Professor Rudiger Wolfram today, who will deliver the lecture. Professor Wolfram is Director Emeritus of the Max Planck Institute for Comparative Public Law and International Law in Heidelberg, Germany, where he has also been Managing Director of the Max Planck Foundation for International Peace and the Rule of Law. Professor Wolfram has held numerous academic posts in his distinguished career, including that of Professor of International Law at the Law Faculty of Heidelberg University. He is perhaps most known to international lawyers from his tenure as judge at the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, which lasted from 1996 to 2017, and where he also served as a tribunal's president from 2005 to 2008. Lastly, and this is a point of particular pride to CIL, Professor Wolfram is also a member of the CIL's International Advisory Panel. The moderator for today's lecture is the E-Academy's co-director, Professor Patricia galvao Telesh. She is Professor of International Law at the Autonomous University of Lisbon, an adjunct senior research fellow at CIL, and a member of the International Law Commission. Professor galvao Telesh, you have the floor. Thank you so much, um, Harry, and let me say how delighted we have we are to have uh, Professor Wolfram with us at the CILE Academy as a guest speaker. And so on behalf of uh, Dr. Nilufar Oral, uh, my very dear colleague and co-director of the Academy, and of myself and of CIL, let me uh, warmly welcome you, uh, Professor Wolfram. Uh, we are um, again uh, happy to host you and very grateful for your generosity, your time and your interest in uh, sharing your knowledge uh, with us. So I want to just uh, uh, let participants uh, of our academy, we are just in our first week, but uh, to let them know, I said that to them a little bit yesterday, but I'll emphasize it, that this is really a unique opportunity to hear from uh, somebody who has um, such a great experience as an academic, as a judge, as a practitioner, um, and this time about international lawmaking and uh, some specific aspects that I'll let Professor Wolfram disclose about uh, international lawmaking. So uh, we will have a presentation from Professor Wolfram, um, and then at the end of the presentation, he has kindly agreed uh, to have our dear participants from the Academy asking questions. So you can then ask your questions um, uh, through the chat or even better, uh, we would be very happy if you also uh, ask a live question by raising the hand function and uh, then turning on your mic and camera and asking the question. But we'll come to that in a little bit. Now we're very eager to listen to you, Professor Wolfram. So the floor is all yours and thank you again for being with us. Thank you, Professor Galvotelis, or rather Patricia, for having invited me. And I am also grateful to Nit Lufer for that. I'm pleased to speak to you again. I have understood only now that Patricia has been speaking about lawmaking before me. Therefore, I'm a little bit puzzled what I will repeat or where I will say something she wouldn't agree upon. Uh, but uh, that's part of the business we are having, two professors, three opinions. Let me come to my talk. Since the 70s of the last century, the system of international lawmaking has changed and I would rather say it has changed dramatically. Until then, the development of inter new international law rules rested on bilateral agreements and some multilateral agreements. Let's not forget, when I started my law studies in 1964, the class on international law was only dealing with customary international law and uh, the UN Charter, nothing else. Can you imagine such a class? I was perfect in the Lotus case and the Red Sea, uh, the Red Crusader case, things you have never heard of. 
it's not necessary, you have heard of. And therefore, we have today in international law a set of norms which is in scope and intensity very, very similar to that of national law. Still, I would say lawmaking, although permanently used, gives us the wrong idea. We are not doing lawmaking as we do in states. But let me come back to my talk. Uh, what has increased are multinational conferences and uh, treaties which came come out of these conferences. The first such conference, the Hague Conference of 1899 and 1907, has left its footprint for international law uh, for its sets of standards for international humanitarian law. You will see in the literature occasionally the reference to the Westphalian peace treaties. Believe me, this is not a multilateral conference uh, as we think of it uh, as of today. This was uh, a network of bilateral conferences and meetings. And uh, by the way, the two peace treaties are extremely boring to read. They decide which prince gets what. And that's the main issue. Now, what is the other reason? The other reason we are having more and more issues which are of interest or of concern, whatever you like, of the international community. Since you have been recently coming out or not yet coming out of the pandemic, you quite well understand what I mean. Uh, diseases of that type can only be uh, fought by an action of all. Therefore, this is clearly a community related interest. Yesterday in her last uh, uh, address to the German Bundestag, Kanzler Merkel said, either we do it together or we will lose a battle against the pandemic. To be a little bit more structured, which are community interests? Community interests are those which uh, those issues which cannot be managed without the participation of at least most states. And these are, for example, the treaties protecting the climate or intending to protect the climate or the ozone layer and now the health. There are treaties, second category, on international spaces like outer space, high seas, etc. And they are finally community interests which are on the basis of agreed ethics such as human rights. All these three types of community re interest related treaties demand the participation of all and that has a very clear and distinct impact upon the way of treaty making. Actually it is a precondition that in these treaties the widest possible participation is envisaged and implemented. And this is not referring to states only. If you look at these multilateral conferences, and they are the conferences which are the motor of today's lawmaking, they also include others. Therefore, we better distinguish between subjects of international law, such as states and international organizations, and actors in international law, such as NGOs, interest groups, or perhaps even individuals. But these are not the only ones, although they are the ones who draft the new treaties, such as the Rio Conference and others or the Paris Conference, to which I will come back later. Another motor of developing international law are the so-called conferences or meetings of parties. These are the treaty, the parties to a particular treaty, and they meet in a conference of parties. If it's a protocol, we speak of a meeting, otherwise we speak of a conference. And they have explicitly or implicitly the mandate at least to develop a certain treaty regime or even to supplement it. 
This is particularly evident in respect of the Paris Agreement on climate change to which I will come a little bit later. Another forum which is of relevance is the, are the treaty bodies. Those of you who are particularly interested in human rights have certainly realized that each single human rights treaty has a treaty body. The Human Rights Committee, the Committee Against Racial Discrimination, etc. They are monitoring the implementation of these treaties. That's of no concern for us in the moment. But by general recommendations or comments, they also develop international law. Let me give you an example. The Human Rights, uh, the treaty body for the International Covenant on economic, social, and cultural rights, for example, has developed the right to water. There is no provision concerning a right to water. It has been developed out of the right to health and life. And this is now a freestanding right to water. And what it is more important, it's being used in international environmental law to implement uh, these uh, agreements protecting groundwater or uh, surface water. Don't underestimate the impact NGOs are having on treaty making. They are either part of a national delegation in multilateral conference or they are active as observers or as commentators or as invited participants. <coughs> there are certain international agreements which have been more or less totally developed by one or more NGOs. Typical is the Biodiversity Convention. It is not a matter whether these NGOs are subjects, as some of the, in the publications claim, or not. This is not the point. They are influential actors which drive the motor of treaty or lawmaking. There is finally to mention the transnational or multinational enterprises. Sure, they have a more indirect influence, but they also are active uh, on their own by agreements between the UN and other uh, members of the UN family, where they pledge to follow certain rules and thus broadening the scope of these rules such as on human rights or such as on international environmental law. Having said that, let me come to more some details. Particularly, and this will lead to the Paris Convention, uh, the, what I call the succession of various instruments. We have a very often a framework treaty at the beginning. For example, the Vienna Convention on the Climate is a framework agreement, which was supplemented by the Kyoto Protocol. Both have meeting or conferences of parties which do the development, and the Paris Agreement is in, belongs to this sequence. Now, every single step in this sequence produces new rules which are being uh, to be added to the norms of international law. Let me uh, concentrate on the Paris Agreement, the most recent one. It developed a sophisticated system of delegating legislative competences to the meeting of parties. The meeting of parties is mandated to do several things and even to issue new rules. It provides two avenues for the meeting of parties to issue legally binding obligations, either by adopting them in mandatory language based on a treaty provision that provides for a legal obligation for each party. For example, under Article 4, Paragraph 2 of the Paris Agreement. 
The second avenue is a provision that authorizes to adopt binding decisions as provided for under Article 4, Paragraph 8 and 4, Paragraph 13 of the Paris Agreement. In both cases, the guidelines or the decisions of the meeting of parties are based upon a mandate of the peace agreement and it is this mandate is accordingly covered by the consent of the state's parties. What I wanted to convey to you, this chain which is leading at the end of the day to individual commitments is consent based. There's another avenue which is a little bit neglected in literature, namely, you, as you know, um, states parties to the Paris Agreement have to submit to the Paris Agreement certain national uh, goals which they intend to achieve within a certain period of time and thus uh, lowering the emission of CO2. What is that, is that? What is the reason or what is the dogmatic of these declarations? Actually, it is the last stone in the building. A unilateral declaration of a state is a source of international law, although not contained in the list of sources under this, in the statute of the ICJ. We all know of the Elan Declaration, where that declaration had a result on the sovereignty over Greenland. Here, this is being used. We have a slow moving train. The first one is a principle, which is already enshrined in the Vienna Convention. Secondly, it's the protocols and in particular, the Paris Agreement, namely to lower, is the uh, to ensure that the uh, climate will not warm up than more, more than 1.5 percent before uh, industrial revolution. And this last stone, so to speak, to fix everything, is a unilateral declaration of states that this is to be done. But please, is that something very new? No, it is not. If you look into the Convention on the Protection of the Ozone Layer, we have, it's again a Vienna Convention, thereafter we have the Montreal Protocol. And the Montreal Protocol mandates the meeting of parties to add new substances to the list of prohibited substances and additionally to uh, increase the commitments. And these commitments, and that's a particular issue, are binding per se. Therefore, when I said at the beginning, we cannot speak about lawmaking in international law, I'm wrong. We are able to do so in these particular areas where law is being made in a new form from, from a principle flowing down to various half commitments or commitments to hard law. Uh, the ILC, and since Patricia is involved in the ILC, it's appropriate, and as a member, I mean, uh, I can quote from that. The ILC has spoken about, uh, in this case, as a conference of states parties, it said, it cannot simply be said that because the treaty does not accord the conference of states parties a competence to take legally binding decisions, their decisions are necessarily legally irrelevant and constitute only political uh, commitments. Uh, that's the ILC report in the ILC yearbook 2018 uh, and uh, commentary on the draft conclusion. This is a very important statement 
for it indicates very clearly this chain which develops from a principle via these bodies into hard law. I could continue that, but I would like to focus on something which is mostly totally neglected. I would like to say that we deal or have also to look into what is generally qualified as internationally accepted standards as mechanisms for the development of international normative order. And I better get to a text, in this case of the Law of the Sea Convention. Uh, as such standards are being made or developed by, amongst others, the, IL, uh, the IMO. Now, what do we have? I, a small excursion into the Law of the Sea. We have the freedom of navigation and ships navigating the high seas, the EZ and the coastal, the territorial waters come under the jurisdiction of states or are governed by the flag state. The IMO develops more and more convention on the protection of the safety of the sea which means safety against accidents and safety from pollution. Now, if you imagine the development of and you in Singapore should do so by keeping an eye on the Singapore Harbor, that ships have developed. Ships are getting increasingly larger, the container ships on the oil tankers are a danger in themselves. Now, what does the IMO do? The IMO produces these conferences, map holes, solars, etc. And they have to be updated over the time. And this is mostly done by um, uh, new rules, namely international standards. If you have the text in front of you, Article 211, paragraph on states, states acting through the competent international organization or general diplomatic conference. It's organization in singular, mind that, this is a reference to the INO, shall establish international rules and standards. The rules are the treaties developed by these and the standards is what I'm dealing with, to prevent, reduce, and control pollution of the marine environment from vessels and to promote the adoption, etc. Therefore, the IMO develops rules and standards. Good. We all know that rules and standards, rules have to be ratified, standards not necessarily, I come to that they have to be implemented. Now, how are they implemented? Let's assume you are the owner of a vessel which is under the flag of, let's say, Mongolia. Uh, that's a landlocked country. By the way, it has a fleet, or at least it has a group of vessels which flying the flag of Mongolia. Mongolia is not particularly active in the IMO for certain. And how is it that one can ensure that the vessels under the flag of Mongolia apply the international rules and standards? Rule number one or possibility number one is traditionally uh, that the flag state does so. In this case, there's would have to be Mongolia, but Mongolia has no means to do that. Uh, they have an office of registration, etc., but they can't control their vessels. And therefore, we have something which supplements this. Let's turn to Article 218. When a vessel is voluntarily within a port, 
or at an offshore terminal of a state, that state may undertake investigations and where the evidence so warrants, institute proceedings in respect of any discharge from that vessel outside internal waters, etc., in violation of applicable international standards. What does that mean? That means that if that vessel comes to, the Mongolian flag vessel comes to Singapore, the Singapore Harbor authorities will inspect this vessel, whether it has violated rules and standards of Mongolia. And this does not, it does, it does not depend upon whether Mongolia has accepted these rules and standards. Now you will say, wait a moment. Professor Patricia has told us yesterday that treaties are binding only upon the parties and not upon third states. Pacta tells his rule. Right. This is a violation of the Pacta Tertius rule if we expect that a vessel under the flag of Mongolia applies the standards applicable in Singapore and not accepted of Mongolia. What is the way out? Patricia is right referring to the Pacta Tertius rule. It's one of the backbones of international treaties. But nevertheless, but some people would now not agree with me, this provision is totally correct. The vessel is, without a distress whatsoever, in voluntarily in the port of Singapore. What law applies in Singapore? It is the law of Singapore. And Singapore is one of the keenest promoters of the protection of the sea and therefore has accepted and is implementing all these rules and standards developed by IMO. Therefore, what is happening here that the territorial jurisdiction of Singapore is being used as a mechanism to enforce or to implement international rules although they are not, uh, so to speak, uh, ratified by the state which is governing uh, the behavior of a particular entity. Therefore, what you see here is that our legislative process works on a combination of state jurisdiction and international norms and they combine each other. This is nothing particularly new. We have the same in international criminal law. In international criminal law, prohibition of torture. Prohibition of torture can be implemented, and this has been sanctioned by the ICJ, by a third state. Remember the case between, I believe it was, Belgium and the Senegal on this issue decided by the International Court of Justice. But this was just for illustration. What I wanted to say that in particular in the WTO system and in the international economic law system, we have plenty of these integrating issues, namely creating standards which are fully implemented, although these are not necessarily international treaties, therefore they belong to what, to the result of lawmaking. For example, the agreement on the application of sanitary and phytosanitary measures, the SPS agreement, contains a certain institutions and they are called upon to harmonize and quote sanitary and phytosanitary measures on as wide a basis as possible based on international standards, guidelines or recommendations where they exist. 
The SPS, SPS agreement itself does not contain any international standards, nor does it provide such standards. It rather refers to standards, and that's my point, developed by the so-called Codex Alimentarius Commission. This is a group of, uh, uh, of uh, industry and consumers producing these standards, and they are brought into international lawmaking by this Codex Alimentarius Commission. The same exists in respect of the Secretariat of the International Plant Protection. Therefore, we have here a particular issue where mostly technical things are being transformed into international law by by the vehicle, by being included or referred to in international treaties. Most intensively, uh, the activities of the OECD are on uh, this standard building, particularly uh, these on against uh, fraud and uh, other manipulations on uh, financial flows. And here these uh, particular elements uh, have a great impact. They are not hard law, still they are the same as hard law when it comes to the implementation. New, by the way, new uh, structures and suggestions are being in the process of being developed. These are the 2019 recommendations on artificial intelligence. Uh, you will wait and see this is going to be a subject which will also haunt the lawyers of us and uh, you, the new generation to whom I speak, pay more attention there too. Uh, I happen to have sons who are in natural science. For them, artificial intelligence is already the normal way of doing things. Uh, we are always a little bit late in the law classes but it will haunt us too. Occasionally, and that uh, comes pretty much to the end of my uh, speech, non-soft law, you would call it, I con call it non-legally binding law, has an influence also on the international motivity, and I would consider this also as part of international lawmaking. I'm totally aware that not the majority of my colleagues will scream that I say so, but I stand firm on that. What do I mean? I give you start with an example. The FAO Code of Conduct on Responsible Fisheries is a non-legally binding instrument. It is Issue, was issued by the FAO for only one reason, that a draft, uh, a draft agreement on responsible fisheries was not adopted by the states. Therefore, the FAO adopted a code of conduct. And now you would say, wait a moment, this is no hard law, which is perhaps an application to follow it. No. It goes beyond that. The FAO requires member states to justify why they don't follow this soft law in the annual reports to be submitted. Therefore, this soft law is being transformed into hard law by referring to the obligations which are on the basis of flow out of the membership uh, issue of states parties to FAO. This is also another mechanism. Let me come to the conclusion to put the various strings together. Still, we have the traditional way of negotiating international agreements. They are negotiated by states, but the scope of participants has increased. That's the first part. 
Therefore, out of the Rio conference have developed a couple of international agreements, which have been negotiated and adopted in the traditional way. Secondly, the Rio conference has developed uh, guidelines such as and uh, programs, which also are the beginning of a new development. And here, general principles play a significant role. I hate to come back to the Law of the Sea, but you can hardly imagine Part 11 of the Law of the Sea Conference Convention without reference to the Common Heritage Principle. By the way, introduced by our part of then permanent representative of Malta to the United Nations. Therefore, these general principles referred to as sources become the beginning, the guideline for interpretation and negotiation, new international sources, therefore becoming an important tool for international lawmaking. These are the substantial elements. Now let's come to the procedural ones. The procedural system of multilateral conferences beginning with the third UN conference on the law of the sea has developed a different form. Instead of relying on an ILC text drafted by experts and done in a perfect way, such as the convention on the law of treaties, now the conference starts more or less with a white paper, sheet of paper in front of themselves and with some very vague formulated principles. Therefore, you can see that in the latter case, lawmaking, and I come back to what I've said about multilateral conferences, with a broader participation is now engaged in lawmaking. This is the first level. The second level is what you could put into quotation marks, the secondary lawmaking law, which is developing from these treaties. As I indicated, you have the possibility to further development of an international treaty, be it a framework treaty, we had not qualified as such, even the Biodiversity Convention has several protocols. Let's go a step further. These are again agreed upon texts, also consent biased. Now the third level is the mandate rendered to meetings or conferences of states parties, which further develop the uh, lawmaking or, and are part and parcel of the lawmaking. And finally, and that is a Paris Agreement where other uh, sources are brought into in this. These are kind of composite treaties constituting non-legally binding elements, principles, hard law, treaty law, and unilateral qualifications. These composite rules are applicable as all the others. I hope I've confused you not too much, only a little bit. And if you don't believe me, do follow the traditional view of international lawmaking, but keep in mind that practice is developing into a different uh, direction, which makes international law much more fascinating than it used to be, and it was quite fascinating even before. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Wolfram. I think you are right in, in saying that um, international law is fascinating. I mean, it's fascinating even if you take a more traditional and strict approach to the sources of international law and to lawmaking, but even more if you take a more uh, creative um, approach, um, which I think I, I mean, I, I agree with you. You said in the beginning that maybe you would be saying different things or things that I didn't agree on um, from what I told students yesterday, but uh, we just had an, an initial uh, round and we didn't go into the detail of, um, of uh, what you were uh, telling us today. But I do uh, agree with you that the, the picture of lawmaking today, international lawmaking, is much more complex.
um, but at the same time richer uh, than if we just stick to Article 38.1 um, of the Statute of the ICJ. And that's a little bit also what I talked with the participants yesterday. But I wanted just to uh, highlight one or two points and then I'll open the floor um, to them participants and there's already one question and I'm sure that will be others that will follow. I think that the picture that you present, um, as you rightly said, is much more close to reality in terms of practice um, because of course we still have the traditional way of international lawmaking um, and we're not speaking now about customary international law, we'll leave that aside uh, for the moment, but about treaty treaties and especially multilateral treaties and especially multilateral treaties that um, in, are intended to address um, issues that have to do with community interests. And I think that point um, was very clear at the beginning of your presentation that here we are really looking at uh, how international law is developed and can be developed in order to meet the challenges of the protection of community interests, be it from uh, be it um, uh, climate, um, uh, human rights, oceans, etc. Et so that I think that's a point that we put this in the context of the protection of uh, community interests. Then the other point is that uh, the issue of having um, today this complex um, uh, treaty making processes that involve not only the framework treaty. Uh, but also the COPs and the MOPs, the, the conference of the parties and the meeting of the parties uh, that themselves also produce, um, um, uh, even if it's secondary or if it's soft law and then combine with the process of then the natural determined contributions in the context of the Paris Agreement in terms of unilateral declarations, they end up by this uh, operation combined although maybe it may be composed of um, soft law bits or non-legally binding bits, in the end, the, the full combined operation ends up by producing hard law, by producing obligations for, for states. And that's, I think that's a very um, interesting approach. And, and one has, and that's a point that I emphasize also to participants yesterday. I mean, we can't really just take a static approach to the sources uh, or simplify the approach to the sources. I think we have to be much more um, uh, 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 have a, take a more complex and more broad uh, perspective. But I had um, one one question for you, maybe just as a, an icebreaker, uh, which has to do with um, uh, what you call the the composite uh, treaty. So, like the Paris Agreement, where you have these different types of elements of uh, uh, in terms of uh, legally bindness um, uh, coming together. Do you think this is going to be a model uh, for the future um, in the sense that uh, uh, it will be more likely in the future that we have um, not the traditional treaties where you have very clear obligations, but rather framework treaties then with the conference of the parties uh, adopting also uh, resolutions and then mixed also with um, uh, unilateral uh, commitments assumed by states. Do you think this is going to be a model uh, for the for the future, for example, if you think that we could have a pandemic a treaty, a treaty dealing with pandemics, or if we could have a, a, a treaty dealing with artificial intelligence, or um, uh, what uh, Professor Tommy Cole called the other day the digital revolution and cyber issues, do you think this this the Paris Agreement model would be in, uh, in this context a model for the future? Um, maybe I'll let you start with that while I'm going to monitor the chat and, and let the participants also the possibility of raising their hands. And I see there's already one. So on the first question, the model for the future, and then and then I'll, I'll give turn over to the participants. Yes, I believe that could be a model for the future. And you answered your question actually yourself, Patricia, for let's assume artificial intelligence. It's too early to, to speak about that. But considering the different stages of development, the different preconditions we are having on artificial intelligence, uh, the states are quite diverse on that. Therefore, what will be the beginning probably will be a very general framework agreement qualified as such or not. And this will be left for further development. 
And at the end of the day, I believe the real commitments can only be made by each individual state as it is being anticipated in the Paris Agreement. This would reflect the diversity of the states, their possibilities, be it political or technical. Let me share with you one uh, explanation on the Paris Agreement. The structure of the Paris Agreement was designed to accommodate the United States. Uh, the United States did want to have a treaty where there were no fixed commitments in the treaty for then they would have to go to the Senate Committee for Foreign Relations, which would be the end of that project. As you know, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee is a graveyard of international treaties. Therefore, the Paris Agreement has no direct commitment from the point of view of individual rights or financially. It all leaves it to a future declaration of the United States, which doesn't meet the commitment uh, of the involvement of the Foreign Relations Committee. And therefore, this can be done by an executive order. This was meant to help the United States. But the system is also uh, positive for others. For each state, we'll then have to discuss with it itself, the parliament, for example, what is our private commitment. And you know that Germany is in the moment, in the last moments of an election campaign. And here, one of the main issues, what are the German commitments to in respect of climate change? This can be better reflected time-wise and substantially if you are leave a certain flexibility. Therefore, my answer to you is yes, this may be the model for the future. However, it should only be the model for subjects which are extremely complex, new, and where the views of the states are still very divergent. Therefore, uh, there are other issues where such a model should not prevail. Therefore, subject and format are two sides of the same coin. So is, by the way, the way of the procedure of lawmaking. Thank you. So we have now um, questions in the chat and questions also from uh, the participants live. Uh, the question, the first question on the chat, um, maybe it's by Danielle Yao, and perhaps you'll be able to ask it live also. I'm trying to see if Danielle, if Danielle, if yes. you want to take the floor. Yes, please Thank you go very ahead. Much. And thank you very much, Professor Wolfram, uh, for a very fascinating uh, uh, survey and pers uh, perspective. Um, I had a specific question, um, firstly, on the code of conduct, um, the FAO code that you mentioned. Um, and I wonder how you view this in relation uh, to the uh, system of compliance mechanism. So, for example, in, in, that, in the case of the FAO code, I mentioned that uh, states' parties will have to, at least rather members of the FAO will have, FAO will have to explain and justify why they did not follow, for example, or comply with the code. Uh, my question is, well, if they do not provide an explanation or if they do, it's all to be unsatisfactory. Like who, who makes it, who makes the assessment? Is it a question of peers, um, other members? Is it a member of the question of committee of a commission? What is the consequence actually? Because the, the mechanism of enforcement is part and parcel of, I would imagine, uh, perhaps even the standards, the enforceability or the strength of that rule and how much is observed. So that's the first question. The second question, sorry, if I may, uh, uh, Professor, uh, Professor Wolfram, is really more comment, uh, but linked, uh, related to the last mm -hmm. set of comments that you had. Um, Coming from the perspective of a state, for example, for state parties, it must be ex extremely difficult and more challenging, and even for individual civil society or business stakeholders to maneuver um, uh, uh, rules which are, which are, I would say, layered with many, many different forms. 
from the framework to protocols to recommendations to guidelines. You almost need a campus to navigate these sort of uh, morass of rules. Um, how, how, what, how does that assist the process or, or in what ways can state parties actually assist to actually navigate that process? Does it, does it make it easier or harder in that sense? Um, I must confess, I find it challenging sometimes to read the UNFCC and the Paris Agreement, followed by all the various, where do I even find these and look for it? I, I, I almost need a campus, somebody to guide me through that process. And I, I find that, that there are certainly advantages, as you mentioned, because international norm making has almost come to a standstill in some areas, but it does present its own set of challenges that I fear that we may ask ourselves many years down the line where we are. Thank you. Thank you. First, uh, the FAO compliance is guaranteed by the FAO system. Uh, they will uh, monitor the compliance. They will ask if compliance is zero or if compliance is missing in certain parts. And they will approach the state concerned. And at the end of the day, uh, they can be uh, taking some soft reactions. Uh, against those states which are not complying. The compliance system in international law is different from national law. You can't put somebody in prison, or, but you can enforce, and you, it is being enforced by a rather uh, soft uh, compliance system. Let me give you one example to explain what I mean. Well, the best compliance uh, system you find in the ozone la layer regime. When at one point uh, Russia didn't comply with the Montreal Protocol, this went to the compliance committee. And the compliance committee was uh, sitting together with Russia about the non-compliance and what could be done to uh, solve the problem. End of the day, Russia received some technical and uh, yes, mostly technical, a bit financial assistance and is now complying fully. We should distinguish in international law with this compliance, which is friendly, cooperative, and the compliance we used to do before, dominantly by sanctions, enforceable. Our public in Europe very much often screams sanctions, do it that way. But this is not always the best way in doing things. Very often compliance can be achieved more in the way as anticipated under the Montreal Protocol. This is my first point. My second, uh, to your second question, I agree with you. The Paris Agreement is difficult to, to read. My advice, to read it as follows. Go to the text, which you have copied, and indicate all rules which are of a procedural nature only. That's quite some. These are grouped and can be qualified as hard procedures, shall do such and such, shall in the nominate its in intentions and so on. That is perfect. In substance, it is softer. It should or will, uh, will make every effort or whatsoever. And these are commitments of conduct. And they become hard law only through this unilateral decision. You find at the end of the day, the obligation of each single state, such as Singapore or Germany, but you don't find, and that's the positive side of the Paris Agreement, not a general commitment. Under the diversity, considering the diversity of states, let me tell you, to have a commitment which is applying for everybody is impossible. This is different from human rights. The obligation not to torture can be applied by every state. But the uh, 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 commitment to reduce 
or CO2 emissions, there you have to look into the realities of that particular state, what can be done. I hope I gave you a, not a satisfactory answer, but an answer which helps you to understand the system. And therefore, human rights will be treated differently from environmental or others. Thank you, Professor Wolfram. We have now a live question from uh, Mohammed Reza, please go ahead. Thank you so much, Professor Wolfram, and also thank you so much, Patricia, for giving the floor. My question is related to international development of international law and also a bit, a little bit of Paris Agreement. I want to know uh, how is it possible to make a mechanism in international law to have more effective enforcement of rules in international agreement. For example, we have Paris Agreement that is have 197 uh, members, but it just have uh, three members or four members like my own country that not ratify it. And if they are uh, behave against the rule of this um, agreement, it could be ruining the environment. Or hypothetically, if we have a pandemic treaties, if just one country, if just one country is not member and uh, behave against this treaty, it could kill all the people in the world. How it is possible to have to solve this problem in international law and develop more effectively of international rules, such as um, because the community interests need to uh, develop these rules to have more effective life, have more. No, the best living in the world. Thank you so much. Thank you. You touch upon a very important point. And one of the elements, uh, and I rephrase what you said, that is that in respect of community issues, which can be uh, successfully achieved and need the participation of all, we are not having a good mechanism to enforce that against all. But let me, and this is typical for my way of arguing, I uh, would like to give you an example. On the protection of the ozone law, a layer, Brazil declared at the beginning, they would now produce this uh, gas which is destroying uh, the ozone layer, in spite of the fact that the production and use of this gas is prohibited under the Montreal uh, on the, under the ozone regime. Therefore, as you said, this would have been undercut or the, is a so-called free rider problem. What did the meeting of states parties under the Montreal Protocol do? They decided that they would not import the states or would not import goods containing this gas and not from states which used this gas in production or which were selling it. All of a sudden, the plan of Brazil to become the substitute for the protection of this uh, gas collapsed. For the majority decided, we will not accept this free rider. Uh, you will in a second see the problem of this approach. The problem is, you can do that vis-a-vis -vis Brazil, but you cannot do that effectively vis-a-vis, -vis, let's say, China or uh, the United States. Uh, I accept that, that's the bad side of that, but in respect of the other part of the world, this mechanism is working. Therefore, one has and did such as in the Paris Agreement, accommodates the US. Having the US on board is one free rider less whom you can't control. That is my answer, a not totally satisfactory answer, but an answer which is also reflecting a reality. Even Iran, from where you come, would not be able to stay totally outside. Give you another example, which is much more striking. Uh, you remember there's an Antarctic treaty system. Uh, it has uh, 
roughly now 60 parties to it, give and take. And they claim to be the trustees for protecting the environment of the Antarctic. And they make sure amongst themselves that nobody else can really enter the Antarctic, start mining or do expeditions, uh, which would violate the very stringent environmental system pre uh, governing of the Antarctic. It works. It really works. Therefore, here it works via the distance. You can't reach Antarctica without going through the Antarctic states. And therefore, it is a fairly safe system. Uh, the other one is less waterproof, but it's also working. Therefore, there is this possibility to a certain extent. Thank you so much. We are just now approaching the end of the lecture, but Professor Wolf, from maybe with your indulgence, we could take one or two more questions. Is, is that okay? Okay, so um, I give the floor now to Sarah Vannan, please. Uh, you can take the floor and ask your questions. Uh, thank you so much, Professor. Uh, greetings, Professor. Um, my question is that um, in your vast experience in the international parlance, what is the main uh, pressing hurdle or challenges that you see in the international uh, lawmaking process? And do you think that um, the states, in terms of incorporating the international obligation into domestic law, is preventing them from carrying out their international obligations? And what are the possible sanctions that could be imposed, uh, especially when we champion much of um, state sovereignty? Thank you. Thank you. Not, an easy, not so easy to answer. Mostly, step number one, to take as many into the regime, into the, to the protective regime on what you have to get everybody involved in the negotiations and possibly into the membership. Secondly, to provide a compliance system which is not the confrontative form of compliance control, but the one I described under the Montreal system. Third, to make sure that those states which are at the level of development gets the proper financial, technical, and other assistance to live up to the commitments they enter. This is my remark. And I believe it works. Thank you so much. So we'll take one last question from the chat. I'll read it out. It's a question from uh, uh, Johaira. Um, and it says as follows, there is this impression that many states resort um, or prefer non-legally non binding instruments, partly to avoid burdensome domestic law requirements for treaties and binding instruments. Is this an accurate impression? Uh, do you think the prevalence of non-legally binding instruments has improved? Um, the normative value of international law as a standard for state conduct and the overall compliance by states with international law. So this is going to be the last question that we'll ask you to uh, answer, Professor Bolfrum. Yes, the factual description I would agree to. Non-legal binding instruments increase. The most dominant one is uh, the Global Compact on Responsible Migration. It's a classic home. But don't overestimate the term legally binding. Uh, this uh, global compact refers to itself as non-legally binding. It's politically binding. And please do take into consideration that states are political units. And whether a thing, an issue is binding legally or non-legally, doesn't make that much difference. If you bring it up in the parliament and accuse the uh, government concerned of not having living up to the global compact on responsible 
uh, uh, migration, nobody can argue, wait a moment, it's not legally binding, but everybody then will say, but you, the government, have said you would live up to this commitment. What's the difference? We have no enforcement system like in national law. There the difference is okay. In international law, it is overestimated. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Wolfram, not only for your very uh, thought-provoking and rich presentation, but also for uh, all uh, the answers that you provided to our participants. We weren't able to go through all the questions, but that's a good sign. That's a sign that there's a lot of interest from our participants. And tomorrow in our lecture uh, that we'll continue discussing international lawmaking issues, we'll be able to touch on some of the issues that uh, uh, you've also discussed today. Um, so I will um, end this uh, uh, on behalf of Nilofer uh, Oral and myself, again, by thanking you, Professor Wolfram, for being with us and sharing all your expertise. And, and also, I think your, um, uh, your very objective observation, but very progressive at the same time and positive thinking for the future in terms of uh, the future of international lawmaking. And, and again, uh, also your very rich experience um, that uh, transpires in everything that you say and, and your good judgment and good sense. I think that's also the uh, very important aspect. So I will give now the floor to um, Harry for some concluding remarks. And, and again, Professor Wolfram, on behalf of the Academy, it's been a great pleasure to have you again and to learn from you. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure to be on your, uh, so to speak, in, in your system and to teaching once again. Okay. Um, thank you, Professor Wolfram, again for this insightful uh, first guest lecture. And thank you all for joining us uh, today on Zoom and on Facebook. Uh, we hope you have enjoyed the lecture and then just a couple of housekeeping notes before concluding. Um, the recording of the lecture uh, will be available on CIL's Facebook page and on CIL's YouTube account. Uh, for registered participants of the Academy, you will also find uh, the recording in the Google Drive. Uh, and please join us next week for a guest lecture by Professor Simon Chesterman of uh, the National University of Singapore on international peace and security. With that, we wish you all a very good day, afternoon, evening, and goodbye. Thank you very much. Good luck. Thank you. All of you. Goodbye. Thank you.